Remembrance Weekend this year takes place in challenging times, but our duty to remember is unchanged. So tonight at the Royal Albert Hall, we will remember all those who helped bring the Second World War to a close 75 years ago. This year's festival will reflect the social constraints that so many of us are familiar with across the UK, but the message is as strong as ever. We salute the members of the armed forces, men and women, past and present, for all that they do at the Festival of Remembrance for 2020.
We are delighted to welcome to the festival His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. This year, as we pause to remember all those who have sacrificed their lives in the service of this country and the Commonwealth, we do so in circumstances unlike any we have ever known. Over these extraordinarily difficult past few months, almost every aspect of our national life has been disrupted. Many of us have been separated from those we love, and together we continue to endure anxiety and grief not previously experienced in peacetime. Through all this, just as in wartime, the very best of our country has been on conspicuous display. We have reaffirmed our faith in each other and in our communities, and seen afresh that service to others underpins our society. We have been reminded that heroes and heroines are all around us and take many forms. This current crisis has afforded us a keener perspective on the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. But we could not come together for V-Day or VJ Day as we had so dearly hoped, but they were nonetheless cherished occasions to remember the sacrifice of those who served in whichever theater of war and to restate our gratitude for all that their generation and the generation before have given us. In this challenging year, we have perhaps come to realize that the freedoms for which they fought are more precious than we knew, and that the debt we owe them is even greater than we imagined. We have seen, too, how much the wartime generation continues to teach us. The actions of veterans, Captain Sir Tom Moore and Private Joseph Hammond, or of Margaret Payne, and many others like them, offer a shining example of selfless commitment and of how even those in their later years can achieve so much good by placing others ahead of themselves. Their example continues to guide our servicemen and women today. Throughout this pandemic, our armed forces have stood side by side with our medical professionals, key workers and emergency services in the fight against coronavirus whilst maintaining the defence of our nation at home and abroad. In many cases, uh, this has meant longer spells separated from their families and extended periods of isolation in order to safeguard the integrity of vital elements of our defence. To our armed forces today and those who came before them, to those who made the ultimate sacrifice and never returned, and to our veterans on whose service our treasured liberty rests, we renew our heartfelt and eternal gratitude. Your example continues to inspire and guide us all. The armed forces have played a vital role supporting the UK's response to coronavirus. During the pandemic, I was deployed as a team member in MTU, Mobile Testing Unit. It was two days training and then straight to work. That time is the proudest moment in my life, putting little contribution towards the country. I was part of the ventilator distribution team. It was an extremely quick turnaround and we were moving ventilators within 24 hours. We went to 55 different sites, moving hundreds of ventilators. My role is a transport manager assistant in the Royal DGC Corp. I have to make sure like all these vehicles are good to go all the time. The reason we all join the army to just to help a nation. I deployed with 4-5 Commando Royal Marines in the Caribbean. My role was to provide medical and logistical support to the Marines and liaise with local authorities and hospitals. Deploying to the Commonwealth and helping with the global crisis, it does bring a great sense of pride to myself and the Marines that we deployed with. 
I was involved in the first uh, medical evacuation that the Puma conducted in Scotland. We were called out in the early hours of the morning to conduct a patient transfer of a critically ill patient from the Isle of Arran to a hospital on the mainland in Scotland. All of my team had a massive sense of pride that all the work they were putting in was to, to help out the UK in its time of need, um, and more importantly, to help out the NHS. We were asked to repatriate up to 70 passengers from the MV Bremar in Havana, Cuba. These passengers were elderly, um, had some mobility issues, displaying symptoms of COVID. The numbers that we were bringing back has been unprecedented. The military supported uh, the Nightingale projects on several fronts. The task was incredibly challenging in terms of the scale of the construction alone, but then when you put into the fact that we were looking at constructing in a matter of days. I don't think you have to go overseas or to go to war to serve your country. What I did as part of the Nightingale project is the most professionally rewarding, challenging and satisfying thing I've done in my career. Just a few examples of the strong support given by the armed forces to frontline workers in the battle against the pandemic this year. They have shown remarkable dedication and service. The very qualities, in fact, embodied by one elderly gentleman who's bridged the generations, much to everyone's delight, in recent months. And his story is a shining light in a rather dark year. Now, if this crisis has had a national hero, it is surely Captain Tom Moore. A World War II veteran who wanted to do his bit to support Britain's doctors and nurses. It began as a little challenge in his back garden. A hundred laps to try to raise a thousand pounds for NHS charities. His fundraising smashed all targets into oblivion. The fund now stands at more than 30 million pounds. An RAF flypast took place to mark the 100th birthday of Captain Tom Moore. Her Majesty the Queen has approved a knighthood in recognition of his outstanding achievement. With every step, every million, every wise word, he is an inspiration and now a knight of the realm. And it's a great pleasure for me to say that Sir Tom is with us at the festival this year. Sir Tom, welcome to you and thank you for being with us. It's been my pleasure to be with you, Hugh. You've worked so hard and in difficult circumstances for lots of people, but have you enjoyed some of the work that you've done? I've enjoyed every minute of it because I felt that we were doing some good and the very fact that so many kind people were contributing money to the service, uh, which was so important and so much money came in, which we never anticipated to that amount, and it, it just got better and better. I'm bound to ask you for your best moment, though I suspect I know the answer, but tell us anyway. <laughs> the most important and, in, and outstanding occasion was when I was knighted by the Queen, because she is such a, a marvellous person, full of enthusiasm. She never, ever looks on the black side, and she's such a a great person for our country and at the moment she is still showing a positive look to all things that are going on. What does remembrance mean to you even in a year like this? How significant is it? Well, I think it's important that we remember that it is a remembrance service not just for the last war but the war before and other wars beforehand, and also the people who've been affected by, by the, the war. So many civilians in this country, uh, in all the cities which were badly bombed, a lot of prisoners of war who were treated so badly. So we must remember all those people whose uh, name is associated with here. Well, that's a message that lots of people will be listening to, Sir Tom and your presence has made this a special festival for us as well. So thank you so much for being with us. It really has been a most remarkable occasion for me. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Standing on the platform, watching you go. It's like no other pain. You 
In this year of notable anniversaries, we remember the Battle of Britain, which took place 80 years ago, and which proved to be a hugely significant milestone in the Second World War. By the early summer of 1940, the Allies were in a desperate position as Nazi Germany pushed through northwestern Europe. The Netherlands, Luxembourg and Belgium were quickly overpowered, and more than 300,000 British, Commonwealth and Allied troops had to be rescued from the beaches of Dunkirk. Hitler knew that if he gained superiority in the air, he could then confidently send his troops across the English Channel. And so it fell to the Royal Air Force to repel the threat posed by the Luftwaffe. We have three veterans of the Battle of Britain to share their experiences with us. The Battle of France is over. The Battle of Britain is about to begin. The Battle of Britain, to me, was everyone, everyone that participated. They always talk about the few. I don't see any difference between the few and the many, really. We were just all doing the same job. I was a junior technician working on some of the radar stations around the UK. The radar system was able to detect German aircraft at some distance. We could plot the progress of the bomber aircraft and get our fighters up in position just as they arrived. I was jolly proud to get that job as a plotter in the filter room, and I loved it. There were a lot of aircraft. You'd have dozens and dozens of little plots on the table. You had to see at a glance where the Germans were coming in and immediately send that through. Scramble five squadrons, Manston and Lim. I was part of the ground crew. From dawn till dusk, the aircraft were going up from five times a day, and we always had to stay there with the aircraft until they got the call to go up. People these days don't realise how many P-51 
people from other countries were in our services and helping us, Canadians, Australians, New Zealanders, Czechs, and some Polish as well. It was very upsetting that the pilots were not coming home. We lost a lot of pilots. In a way, you've shut your mind off away from it, but there was a lot of sacrifice. That was a really sad time. But that's life and that's a war and you have to face these things. I was just one of many thousands, really, that were doing the same job. And we all had the same aim, really, and that was to preserve our way of life. Through control and via the telephone, we received news that the enemy was building up in France, the 100 plus, 200 plus, 300 plus, 400 plus. And you look around you and you think, my God, there are only 12 of us here. You know, where do we start? We lost a lot of pilots. I mean, our pilot, my squadron alone, I think, lost about 12 or 13 pilots. Life in a fighter squadron in those days with wonderful blokes doing your job, I wouldn't have changed it for anything at all. It never occurred to me, and it never occurred to, I don't think, the people with whom I fought, that we would ever be defeated. The Germans couldn't invade us until they had air superiority. I don't risk it. I had, I never had superior superiority because we didn't let them. As fighter pilots flying in the defense of our country and fighter command in a very good aeroplane, we stopped them. The Battle of Britain was a critical stage. And I think now people should really, do realize, I think, that had we lost the Battle of Britain, we probably, very probably, have lost the war. I was at the, the right age, the right age, the right place, the right time, the right everything. And it got it was really good to me and I got away with it. And I was such a privilege to have taken power. This poem was written in 1941 by fighter pilot John Gillespie McGee. Serving in the Royal Canadian Air Force, he died in a collision over England, age 19. High flight. Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter-silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamt of. Wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the wind-swept heights with easy grace, where never lark or ever eagle flew. And while with silent, lifting mind I've trod the high, untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touched the face of God. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many so few.
Well, every year at this festival, we all look forward to welcoming the men and women of the Royal Hospital Chelsea. This year, for reasons that we all understand, that isn't possible. But with a little bit of help from Michael Ball and Alfie Bow, we did manage to make sure that they could take part. Where are the boys of the old brigade who fought with us side by side? Shoulder to shoulder and blade by blade, fought till they fell and died. Who And isn't it wonderful to see so many of the Chelsea pensioners determined to take part in this year's festival? Many of them, of course, drawn from that Second World War generation. And this year marked the 75th anniversary of the formal end of that conflict, the deadliest in history, involving more than 30 countries, fighting on three continents, and costing more than 60 million lives. For Britain, the Commonwealth and the Allied powers, it was a wave of tragedies and triumphs that paved the way to victory in Europe. And by the spring of 1945, the news reports were beginning finally to suggest that victory was on its way. This is the testimony of Elsie Brown, a housewife who lived in the East End of London. I never missed evening prayers because my husband, Bert, was in the artillery somewhere in Germany. And it, it's silly, I know, but I thought that evening prayers was a way of staying in touch with him. I imagined him, wherever he was, listening to and thinking about home. Of course, I didn't ever know if they broadcast it over there. Probably they didn't. Anyway, this night, I was still warm in the pot when I heard the news. This is London calling. Here is a news flash. The German radio has just announced that Hitler is dead. I repeat that. The German radio has just announced that Hitler is dead. At first, I didn't believe it. Then I thought, it's on the BBC. 
So it must be true. I didn't know what to do. I wanted to tell someone, so I decided to run next door. My neighbour, Vi, worked the late shift on the buses and was always up till midnight. So I went round and I, and I banged on her door. And when she opened it, I shouted something like, he's dead, dead. And she said, what, Alfie? So I said, no, not Alfie, Adolf. When the penny dropped, Vi said, here else, you better come in. But I couldn't because I'd left the kids asleep. So she came back with me and bought a bottle of Guinness that she'd been saving for a special occasion. And we shared it. She said, do you think it'll all be over soon? I think I nodded. And I remember I suddenly started crying. I don't know why. I couldn't stop. Never in history has an entire people borne so frightful an ordeal so bravely. The war started when I was still quite young. You did know that life was difficult and you got to come to terms with it and we grew up. I joined the Fannies, the first day nursing yeomanry, as a code and cipher operator. I'd find out what the agents were doing and what the Germans were doing. I joined the Royal Air Force in Jamaica. I was very happy to join the Air Force because I know what, where I was going. I was going to England to serve the mother country. When I got here, I was sent to a maintenance camp. If you don't have good maintenance, you're only able to have a good flying crew. I was 18 when I joined the Royal Army Ordnance Corps. The important thing was that the infantry and the advanced units had everything they wanted. Tank carriers, transporters, every type of vehicles. Without that regular supply, the army couldn't advance. The army pushed forward, and then we followed them through Belgium, through Luxembourg, into Germany. And I was sent to near Hanover, a place called Cellar. I saw cattle trucks with, on the side, seven horses, 40 Jews. And I found I was near Bergen-Belsen. I saw those who were able to walk coming out. Uh, it was very, very moving seeing them. It's extremely emotional. It was very important that we kept everything strictly secret, working with the underground movements in Southern Europe, looking ways to save people's lives and to correspond, keep in touch with them, know what was happening, what the dangers were, and passing the information back to London. We knew that it was going to be a, an enormous relief when the war in Europe finished. I got a message saying, go back to the UK, I got on the train, it was boarded up, complete darkness. When I got out the train at Bruges, uh, everyone told me that the war had been over the day before. The end of the German war had come 11 months after the landings in Normandy. I wrote to my sister back in London on VE Day. We danced and everyone looked a bit dazzled and we could feel the excitement and relief over the whole room. So unusual that I wanted to cry. The camp gate was flung open. The commanding officer says, go out and enjoy yourself. It is one of the most pleasurable day in my lifetime.
attitude and latitude, he falls in to the bar. In boogie rhythm, he can't blow no less. He's facing guitar, he's playing with her. He makes a comedy jump when he plays rapidly. He's a boogie boogie bugle boy, a company B. I was just six and a half on VE Day and remember thinking how silly all the adults were behaving. I realize now they were tipsy. I had no memory of life before the war, so seeing people singing, dancing, and being so happy was a new experience. Although people had very little on VE Day, everyone went to so much effort to make it special. There were long trestle tables, neighbors shared their food, tea and sugar, and there was a huge bonfire in the communal area at the back of the row. A lot of my friends' fathers had been away fighting, and I remember one mother spent the day crying because her husband was in a Japanese prison of war camp. For many, it was such a happy day, but for others, the war wasn't over yet. The war of jungle fighting, of ambush and sniping in Burma. It was appalling, especially during the monsoons. I was motor transport driver, and our job was trying to discover any planes that had crashed. We would try and salvage any parts that we could and, of course, destroy it so the Japanese couldn't get any. I was born in the 19th century, and I was born in the 19th century. I was born in Sri Milkor, and I was born in the 19th century. The communication was such a thing. If there was a communication, then the war would be destroyed. I was on HMS Indefatigable. I used to arm up the sea fires. Our job was to stop the fires, because planes, really hundreds of them, these uh, kamikazes, you know. Japan's growing desperation is reflected in this fanatical sacrifice of pilots and aircraft in a crazy attempt to hold the Allies off. I was 14 stone when I joined the RAF. After 12 months in Burma, I was seven and a half stone. It was the Okinawa landings when our ship got hit. Killed, uh, I think it was about 17 of them. The stench, burning flesh, you know, and it's terrible. On August 5th, a single bomb destroyed the Japanese city of Hiroshima. Japan When the bomb was dropped, we were all pretty pleased we weren't going on the invasion. We didn't want to do a D-Day out there. Japan has today surrendered. Boom, everybody just cheering, happy sort of thing, it was all over. We were tasked with bringing back the prisoners of war, skin and bone, some of them. I came home in May 47. You stepped into a new world, but you missed all those comments that you left behind. This is the testimony of young mother Megan Ryan on VJ Day. Too tired to move, I sat thinking of those six years. When they began, I'd been 20, full of enthusiasms, ambitions, certainties, and the energy of youth. 
I'd married, born children. But the war had stolen from us the simple, ordinary joys of a young couple shaping a shared life. We had known the agony of separation and the too rare, too short, too heightened joy of reunions. Apart, we had endured illnesses and dangers and fears for each other. I thought of those who had been dear to us, who had not lived to see this, of John, who had stood at the altar with us on our wedding day. John, who had been trapped in his cockpit when his plane sank beneath the waves. Of Ron, constant companion of my brother since school days, who had vanished without trace when the troop ship he was on had been sunk by the Japanese. Of Peter, my girlhood friend's kind brother, who had been shot while trying to escape the prisoner of war camp to which he had been taken. They were all so young, the youngest 19, the oldest 24. I sat thinking of them and then went indoors to stand looking at the sleeping faces of my two little boys, whose lives lay before them in a world of peace. And let's give the warmest welcome to the Second World War veterans joining us at tonight's festival. And they are sisters Jean and Pat Outram, and Norman Bartlett, and Mervyn Kirsch, and Rajinda Singh Dat, and Frank Ashley, and Albert Jarrett. Welcome to all of them. Well, I'd like to thank every one of the veterans for their presence in the hall tonight at the festival. Let's listen now to the words of Norman Bartlett, uh, a Royal Naval veteran who saw action in the Atlantic and in the Far East. 75 years ago, my generation celebrated victory, having fought for just cause and won but the price we paid was high. Every day I remember my comrades who lost their lives so that we could live in a free world. I also remember prisoners of war who suffered tremendously, some of whom my ship helped to return home. Today, it is easy to think of them as statistics, but we should remember that they were fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, husbands, wives, all with loved ones, who just like you and me, carried hope for a better life. 
It is our duty to help future generations to continue to remember them and protect the freedoms they died for. We must never forget those people who paid the ultimate sacrifice on the home front and abroad. And our thanks to Norman for sharing his thoughts and experiences with us. Well, memories of the global conflict were still vivid in the minds of millions of people just a few years later, when tensions between the world's two great superpowers, the Soviet Union and the USA, came to a head on the Korean Peninsula in 1950. Now, Korea had been divided into two zones. The North was run by the Soviet Union and the South by the USA. In 1950, with the support of the Soviet Union, North Korea launched an attack on its southern neighbour. Britain and more than a dozen countries joined the US as part of a UN force, and they soon faced the might of the Soviets, backed by China. Now, of the 90,000 British soldiers who took part in the Korean War, more than 1,000 lost their lives. And many of those who fought still feel very strongly that this is a forgotten war. Let's listen to the experiences of two of the veterans. I joined the uh, Royal Marines on June the 14th, 1949. 12 months later, I was on my way to Korea. When we got there, we learned that the Chinese had come into the war and taken up positions all the way around Chosin Reservoir. The Americans up at the reservoir are outnumbered by at least 10 to 1. 5,000 Marines are in camp under enemy fire, battle-worn and short of supplies. Our unit had been given the job of forming a convoy and, and breaking through the Chinese. It was a huge convoy, well over 100 lorries. Every time they stopped, machine gun fire came in. Ping, 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 all over the place. And my good friend, Joe Belsey, we were just lying together. Joe was killed. That night, we all said our prayers. And uh, how three or four of us managed to get away from that back of that truck with those bullets coming in like that, unimaginable. We lost 20 odd killed. We had another 20 odd take prisoner and they were in those camps for three and a half years. You knew national service was coming up and that soon after your 18th birthday you would be called up. And in January 1951, I was commissioned into the King's Own Scottish Borderers. The regiment was sent off to Korea. Chinese troops eventually launched a major attack. One of the officers in charge of the platoon alongside me was wounded, and so I took charge of his platoon too. Casualties, of course, were quite heavy. The first time one had seen one of your own men killed, you, uh, I suppose, ceased to be a boy and became a man. I was able to evacuate some very badly wounded men. News came through that I had been awarded the Distinguished Service Order, and I think it was more for the recognition of national servicemen as a whole, what they had achieved. South Korean people are very appreciative of what the United Nations did to save their country. The war in Korea may seem a long time ago and forgotten, but we will not forget.
British forces were last in active conflict on the ground six years ago in Afghanistan, but they continue to operate around the world in some of the most hostile environments on Earth. Earlier this year, Lance Corporal Brody Gillen, a reservist medic, was on tour in Iraq when her military base came under rocket attack. She was killed in that attack alongside two American soldiers. Her mother and sister wanted to pay her this tribute. She was very generous and kind and... Mischievous and, and a wee naughty smile, a wee cheeky smile. She could be girly and, and cute and funny and be boisterous and adventurous and, and, yeah, she could be all that. A long time, Aim would have been a paramedic. Yeah. But she, she really thought that you know, the army would give her the opportunity and the experience that she would need to do that. She did a degree and when she came back, she, that's when she decided that she was going to, to join up as a reserve. Although she was in the reserves, Brodie seemed to fit right in. She was so good at her job. I'm a gonna go to Iraq for six months. <laughs> she deployed to Iraq on her birthday, the 9th of December 2019. I didn't think that she would be in any kind of danger at all. On the 11th of March, went to bed at 10, big knock at the door, and the woman from the army had come along. She asked if, if we were Brody's relatives. And she said she'd be killed in action. Asked her if she was sure, and she said yes. Yes, she was. Normally with somebody in Brody's position, she would have had a military funeral, but because of the COVID restrictions, yeah, we just couldn't do that. I think that's what COVID did. It, it took away those opportunities to remember her and celebrate her life because we couldn't have um, what we felt was, you know, the full funeral. We asked people to light a candle for her um, the night of the funeral and shared it on social media. We watched them um, come in. Yeah, on the night, we watched them coming up. From all over the world. Remembrance Day services makes me feel better that the, that's going to happen every year, that people are going to remember. We are very clear how Brodie would want us to continue. It would be be kind, be generous, be ambitious, be tenacious, be all the things she was. Feels as if she's still away and that she could be back any time. I don't actually think we'll ever come to terms. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Blind, but now. 
As we prepare for the solemn two minutes of remembrance, this year's muster reflects these challenging times and the constraints of social distancing. So it's time to welcome the men and women of the armed forces. So we have far fewer representatives with us tonight, but their presence reminds us of the many thousands who serve in so many capacities. Ten representatives of the Royal Navy. And they include the Royal Marines and Queen Alexandra's Royal Naval Nursing Service. They've been working very hard to help the NHS in responding to the pandemic. With us too are the Royal Navy Reserves, the Royal Fleet Auxiliary and the Royal Marines Reserves. The youngest of the reserve forces formed 72 years ago. Ten representatives of the army led by the 1st Battalion Grenadier Guards. They've been heavily involved in running some of the COVID testing centres. King's Troop, Royal Horse Artillery with us too. And then we have the Royal Gurkha Rifles and the Queen's Gurkha Signals. Following them, the Army Air Corps. And the final part of the Army presence is the Army Reserves. representatives of the Royal Air Force, including regular serving members from RAF Northolt, representatives of the Queen's Colour Squadron at the festival. And to complete this military segment of the muster, we have the Royal Air Force Reserve. We also welcome members of the Merchant Navy, the Civilian Services and the Royal British Legion. Six representatives of the Merchant Navy in the hall tonight, They're marking 75 years after the end of the Second World War when 30,000 merchant seamen lost their lives. And then the Civilian Services from the Royal British Legion, which of course has been working very hard this year to promote the poppy appeal despite the difficulties posed by the pandemic. Civilian services also including St John Ambulance and the police, the fire and rescue services and the British Red Cross. In charge of all the military arrangements at the festival, Garrison Sergeant Major Andrew Stokes. And in charge of all the talented military musicians is Lieutenant Colonel Simon Hoare, Commanding Officer of the Household Division Bands. Everyone coming together to pay tribute to those on the front line this year. So I work full time within the NHS on the intensive care unit and then part time I'm a RAF reservist. I joined the army before I went to university. I did my basic training. At the moment I'm working as a nurse in critical care. Due to the nature of COVID-19 we were having a lot more patients um, coming into critical care who needed ventilating. I deployed in 2011 to Afghanistan but I would say that this situation was worse than Afghanistan. For the sheer volume of patients that we had and how sick these patients were, they were incredibly sick. It was just something like out of a horror film. It was something that none of us have really experienced in our lifetimes before. So we had nurses who'd never had any intensive care training and were really willing to learn. And all of a sudden they were looking after some incredibly sick patients. And actually these redeployed nurses became an absolute credit to the NHS. Family members weren't allowed to visit their loved ones. Even when their loved ones were dying, they couldn't come in to say their goodbyes. So they did want that reassurance that their loved ones is not going to be left alone as they're passing away and know that we're gonna be there for them when they can't be. But it was just heartbreaking. One day we had a young lady who was pregnant and she'd been on the intensive care unit for quite a few weeks. And I turned around and I saw her smiling at me. 
And that was such a heartfelt moment. And I just realized that we can do this. We can, we can beat this virus. When I carry the book of remembrance, I'm going to be thinking of the soldiers who lost their lives during my Afghanistan deployment, but also all the healthcare workers around the nation that have lost their lives to the coronavirus. Let's welcome Flight Lieutenant Laura Foster and Corporal Passera, which I see, and their colleagues from the nursing profession. We are very pleased to welcome Her Royal Highness the Duchess of Cornwall to the Festival of Remembrance. As the proud Commodore-in-Chief of the Royal Naval Medical Service, it's a huge honour for me to pay tribute to our wonderful nurses, both military and civilian. The World Health Organisation designated 2020 the first ever global year of the nurse and midwife. It was intended to be a year of celebrating nursing and midwifery, professions which, of course, touch us all at some points of our lives. This year has not turned out exactly as any of us could have anticipated, but it has truly been the year of the nurse and midwife. Military nurses have worked alongside their NHS colleagues across the United Kingdom, using the skills learnt in conflict in battle against COVID. You have been the very epicentre of the nation's response to the pandemic, providing a critical line of defence with compassion and dignity and bringing hope and healing to so many. And you've done this all the while being held at readiness for military deployment. For your service, we are deeply in your debt. And yet, as we know, behind each act of service 
lies the sacrifice. This can take many forms. Missing your much needed rest, enforced separation from your families, and even putting your own lives at risk. Today, as we reflect on sacrifice, we remember those nurses who have given their lives in the fight against COVID. 2020 was chosen to be of the year of the nurse and midwife, in part because it marks the 200th anniversary of the birth of Florence Nightingale. In April, I had the privilege of opening the NHS Nightingale Northwest Hospital. On that occasion, I quoted Queen Victoria's words on Florence Nightingale. Her mind is solely and entirely taken up with one subject, the subject of medicine. Today, our military nurses, we see the same unswerving determination to give the best possible medical care whenever and wherever you are called. Your service and sacrifice will never be forgotten. To each and every one of you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Our thanks to Her Royal Highness for that tribute to the nursing profession. It is, of course, uh, an expression of deep gratitude, and that gratitude underpins our service of remembrance, which is in the hands of the National Chaplain to the Royal British Legion. 75 years after VE Day and VJ Day, and 70 years on from the beginning of the Korean War, we remember with thanksgiving and sorrow all those whose lives have been given and taken away in the cause of justice and freedom. We express our gratitude for the spirit of service and the readiness to sacrifice self for the sake of others, which pervades the history of our armed forces. And today we celebrate in particular the most elderly members of that community, whose legacy we enjoy and whose example of fortitude and solidarity continues to inspire us all. Facing one of this nation's most difficult times, their generation has often had the most to bear during the coronavirus crisis. So while we honor their contribution, we also commit ourselves to their care and remember men and women from the Army, Navy and Air Force who have worked tirelessly alongside essential workers on the front line in the fight against COVID-19. And now, wherever we are, whatever our circumstances, we bring all our hopes and fears, joys and sorrows together in the words Jesus taught us.
So now we pray, God Almighty, creator of all, we pray for those who suffer the consequences of fighting, acts of terror, and disease, especially through bereavement, disability, and pain. We ask for your comfort, remembering in particular those who had no opportunity to say goodbye, and commend to you the Royal British Legion in its ministry of care and support for veterans and their families. We pray too for the Legion's patron, our Sovereign Lady Queen Elizabeth, that you will bless and sustain her in all that she is and does. Lord, we pray also for all members of the armed forces community committing to your care, those of every age, religion, and race. And at this time of global crisis, we pray that you will grant us a renewed spirit of respect for one another and unite us all in love for you and for our neighbors. Enable us to build harmony and bring hope in our families, our communities, and the Commonwealth. And so guide our paths and lead us in the ways of peace that our lives may speak of your justice and mercy, now and forever. Amen. Teach us, good Lord, 
to serve you as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for any reward, save that of knowing that we do your will through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them.
When you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow, we gave our today. The Lord Jesus Christ be near to defend you, within to refresh you, around to preserve you, before to guide you, behind to justify you, above to bless you, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God for evermore. Amen. And that concludes the Festival of Remembrance for 2020. Tomorrow, the Queen and members of the Royal Family will gather in Whitehall at the Cenotaph. Our coverage begins at 10.15 on BBC One. But for now, from the team at the Royal Albert Hall, thank you for watching and good night. <laughs>